Hello and welcome to the Integrated Rehab and Performance Podcast. My name is Dr. Nick Curtis and I'm running the show here at the Integrated Rehab and Performance Center. Today we are talking about your mobility and more specifically, what is it that is limiting your mobility? So this week we are discussing the difference between what we would call a tissue extensibility dysfunction and a joint mobility dysfunction. So what is the difference between these two and why is it important to distinguish? Well, first and foremost, it's important to distinguish the two because the treatments um, for each one will be different. So if you identify in a golfer or a crossfitter that they have a hip mobility issue or Let's just say, let's go one step um, back, actually, and just say, hey, you struggled to get to the bottom of a squat, or hey, you struggled to get into the top of your backswing without compensating um, or coming out of or losing your posture. Um, and we might say, this seems like it's coming from your hip. Why is it that that hip uh, isn't able to get to that position? Maybe we'll take a closer look at it. Um, what are some things that we would do? We would take a look at um, individual joints, range of motion. We'd look at the actual muscle, feel palpate the muscle in that area. What is the tonicity of that? Is it hypertonic, which means it's like tight, or is it not so much and it's a healthy, loose muscle? Or is it underdeveloped, maybe even like an atrophic, which could um, be a signal for some maybe more serious things going on, or just imbalances, right, in the way we've been training and playing, right? So important to take a look at all those things. We also want to know what the joint play feels like. That's kind of a a chiropractic term where we're palpating the joint itself to see when we take you to kind of end range, what does it feel like when we palpate and uh, give it some play into that? Is it kind of a hard end feel or is it soft? If it's soft, we think, well, that joint, uh, the capsule, everything around it seems to be doing okay. The mobility issue is probably coming from maybe the muscle. But if that joint end feel is very firm and rigid, we think, okay, there's some work to be done here in the actual joint capsule and the joint itself. Again, being more of a joint mobility dysfunction. So there's different things that we would look for, and we do different things for each. Let's talk a little bit today about the two and how we might go about treating them. Okay, so a joint mobility dysfunction. Let's talk first about the joint itself. This is where a finding might be, if we're looking at the hip, we are playing around um, in the hip at its in different positions and seeing what is it like when we push around different in different ways and get into the different parts of that actual hip capsule. Is it a hard end feel? which is a soft end feel for joint mobility dysfunction. So a lot of times it'll be that hard end feel. Um, also, we will find that there isn't maybe any hypertonic or very tight muscle that would be that would make sense to be restricting that uh, joint for whatever range of motion we're looking for. Say it's internal rotation. We might find that the external rotators aren't really that tight, right? We're palpating not very tight. And that joint has a very rigid end feel that's telling us, hey, this is a joint. We want to get to that joint capsule and affect that joint itself. Now, what are some things that we can do to affect the joint mobility dysfunctions is, well, a chiropractic adjustment um, at the extremities or the spine. Um, Beyond that, we can do some banded mobilizations are really good at getting into the joint mobility dysfunctions. Um, So these are becoming more popular and they've been more popular in the last couple of years. They're really good at some things. And this is one of them when we have a uh, a joint mobility dysfunction that isn't maybe responding or it's so uh, there's so much going on it's so uh, we can just say simply it's so bad right that we need to get some real load real tension and uh, distraction into that joint and open it up then uh, these, these banded mobility things are really good at uh, doing that so I want to give you some examples I'm just going to play two examples of some like banded joint mobility dysfunctions again we would do or sorry not dysfunctions but uh, drills we would do some chiropractic adjusting and then supplement that with some of these banded mobility drill stuff here. So I'll show you two simple ones. Okay, for our banded hip mobilization, what we do is we get a big band. We wanna put our foot through, getting this band up as high as we can and towards the groin. And we want that under a lot of tension. So we're gonna step out as far as we can. Okay, again, this is as high as, up, as, high up as we can get it. From here, what we're gonna do, this is pointing out perfectly uh, 90 degrees from my hip, is we're gonna use our our hand to help push our knee in towards the midline, hold here for a breath, and then let it open. We can push five to six times. Again, putting as much tension on this band as we can to open up that hip. From here, what we can do now is use our glute to actually let that hip open back up, and then pull it back towards the center. Now we're opening it back towards the center. So again, it's pushing in, 
and then it's opening back up. For the supine banded shoulder mobilization, there's a few different ways to do this, but what we're gonna do is we're gonna attach a band at about ground height, and we're gonna lay to the side of it with the band coming out at around shoulder height. So if I'm doing my left arm here, I'm gonna pull the band, get good tension in the band, pull it around my arm like this, should be resting through my armpit around just the top of the humerus, and then back around the top of the shoulder. Get it as high into that armpit as you can, as low, or sorry, as deep into that shoulder joint as you can. And then from here, we're just gonna grab our opposite shoulder, and we can either actively bring that elbow towards our forehead and back down, or passively do that where I'm just gonna use my other arm to help move the shoulder joint and let the band distract that humerus out of that joint. Really good for opening up the back of the shoulder. Another progression here is to go arm up overhead and then actively bring it into flexion and letting that band pull the shoulder or passively doing that, which feels a little bit better to me. Bring that arm in as much flexion as we can and letting the band pull that shoulder out. And then the last one is coming across body like this. You should feel nice stretch in that shoulder capsule. Now, beyond that, another reason that we might have a joint mobility dysfunction um, is the actual positioning or the biomechanical kind of uh, relationship of the skeleton. So that's a fancy way of saying like something like an anterior pelvic tilt, if you're all familiar with that. It's where the pelvis is kind of tilted down forward for whatever reason. Um, there's all sorts of implications that come along with that. So it's highly associated with low back pain in some cases, in some cases, um, and that, that argument can be made um, again. All sorts of things that um, it, we now look at when that pelvis is in that position, what are the muscles, what positions do they have to be in, right? So there's different implications there as well. But what we're mostly concerned about right now is when that, say, the pelvis entry tilted is what is the new positioning of the femurs on the acetabulum? It's where they connect um, on the pelvis itself. And so now with the entry pelvic tilt, what is the positioning of those femurs on that acetabulum? they are in a different position than they would be otherwise if that pelvis was in a neutral position. So we've just changed the interface of that femur on that pelvis, uh, that pelvic connection. That changes mobility. So we have an orientation issue, that uh, anterior pelvic tilt or anterior orientation of the pelvis that is affecting our mobility. We'd call this a, again, this would be more of a joint mobility dysfunction. We'd run out of room quicker. In some cases, we'd have more room. And the end play would be a hard end feel end play. And so there's certain ways that we can start the process of addressing these orientations as well. And it's a very common one that we do in the office. You'll see, um, I will show you two very simple uh, starter uh, drills that we can do that we often do to help with anterior pelvic tilt to help kind of pull us back into a neutral position as well as um, addressing rib flare where that those ribs are kind of pointed up towards the ceiling and not tucked down uh, by their side where we can get the obliques back involved to help um, address these orientations at the rib cage and the pelvis. So let's take a look at two exercises here. All right, this is the supine 90 breathing exercise. For this, we're gonna use a foam roller or a small ball between our knees. This just helps keep our feet in line with our knees, in line with our hips. And from here, stay subtle lift of the tailbone off the floor. We wanna keep belt line touching the floor here and our low back on the floor as well. And then we just maintain this position as we breathe. And again, the breath is really important for this. We're going to take a big breath in through the nose. And then all the way out through the mouth. But we want to think of letting the air kind of fall out of our mouth. It's a long exhale. You should feel the ribs starting to come in towards each other. And the obliques starting to work hard to do that as we push every last bit of air out. So again, tailbone comes off the ground. We use our hamstrings to just peel the tailbone off the ground. Our heels are digging into the wall and pulling down. That's what activates the hamstrings there. And just use that contraction to slightly lift the, the tailbone off the ground. Big breath in through the nose. Let that air fall out of your mouth on the way out. Feel the ribs come in toward each other. Maintain that contraction. Maintain that rib position as you breathe back in through your nose. And then again, exhale. 
When we get to the end of our exhale, just check, make sure the hamstrings are still working, make sure the tailbone is slightly peeled off the ground there, and make sure our heels are still contacting the wall. The toe should be pretty loose. We want a full foot contact. We want most of the uh, contact being through the heels as we're tugging down on the wall. And then we're just repping that out. Give it a shot. Okay, this is a hook lying breathing exercise. It's a great place to start for any of our breathing exercises where we're gonna focus on internal rotation of the ribs, and we're just gonna use our breath and our diaphragm to start getting movement through our ribs and our thoracic spine. So, for this one, we want you in the hook lying position, which is just your feet flat on the floor, about a 90 degree angle at the knees. From here, I want you to feel your ribs on the outside, kind of place both your hands through here like this, Try to get your low back close to flat on the ground, and you should be fairly comfortable here. Now, what I want you to do is breathe in through your nose and then exhale through your, through your mouth. And I want you to think about fogging a glass in front of you. And I want you to keep exhaling, keep exhaling, keep exhaling. And I want you to feel your side abs start to work to actually push that air out of your mouth, especially towards the end. So you're going to actually be working fairly hard here in the core to push the, the very last bit of air out of your lungs. And you should feel your hands starting to approximate or get closer and closer together as your ribs actually start to close in and get closer and closer together. So again, breath in through your nose. Exhale through your mouth nice and slow. Then from here, your next inhale through your nose, I want you to maintain some of that tension that you just created in your, especially in the side of your abs that kept, that brought those ribs in. I want you to keep those ribs in like they were at the end of the exhale by maintaining some of that tension in your core, right? So about 40% of that tension that you had, I want you to keep, uh, keep that contraction and then breathe in through your nose again. And I don't want your ribs to just flare wide open like this right? Just flaring wide open as we take a big breath. But since we have that tension here, it's going to keep those ribs relatively internally rotated or closed down on each other, preventing them from just flying right back open. And then from here, I want us to do five or six breaths and you'll get a decent work uh, workout in the core. Especially, I want you to focus on trying to feel the breath moving the ribs on the side inward. I want you to feel the side of your core working mostly, right? But I don't want you just clenching down or flexing or even crunching through here. I want it to all come from your breath, right? So this is something we have to practice. So as we exhale, the exhale and the diaphragm coming down creates all that tension and then the, the obliques start to work to again, help close off that space to help push that air out. Okay, and from there, just working on maintaining that position as we breathe in. So give that a try. Now, if we have a tissue extensibility dysfunction, again, this is more like we have hypertonic or tight muscles that are restricting motion. So if our hip internal rotation is limited and we say, hey, that joint end feels actually pretty good, it's pretty soft, um, it's not very hard, there doesn't appear to be any anterior pelvic tilt we need to worry about. And, uh, but when we palpate, we feel that those muscles are tight, right? We can feel it with our, with our hands. We say, mm, this is probably a tissue extensibility dysfunction. That's when we start doing things like a a stretch, a pin and stretch of that muscle um, where we're getting that proprioception back into that muscle there. Um, different things like a dynamic stretching and uh, couple that with active uh, movement and contractions to get those muscles lengthened under tension and load, right? There's different ways we can build upon that, but that's where we start doing those more classic and um, other techniques to lengthen that tissue to help um, improve that mobility, in this case, tissue extensibility dysfunction. Um, now, beyond that, it's important to make sure that we are, again, assessing to make sure we have the right issue that we're dealing with, and then we have, we're using the right tactics to treat each version of uh, the issue. Again, this is addressing the tissue length and the gamma motor tone of that tissue or, or muscle, which, again, gamma motor tone being the effect in the gamma motor neurons, which, uh, to keep things simple, they are kind of the 
the switches that gauge length and tension in the uh, muscles. So they let us know when to almost when to feel that sensation of stretch and that discomfort from some stretch um, because they are kind of setting the switch for what, what we would consider to be normal length. And you can imagine how muscles can, that switch can kind of get set to a shorter um, setting, if you will, when these muscles are chronically shortened. Maybe they're not being lengthened all the time. Right? You can imagine a very simple scenario where we're sitting a lot and these hip flexors are in a shortened position. Now, <clears throat> sorry, they tend to feel stretch quicker and uh, they get tighter because their home position is a shorter position. That gamma motor neurons adapt to that shorter position and we need to get them to readapt, to let go, so we're not feeling stretch sensations when we shouldn't be. And we can get that muscle to start lengthening again a little bit more comfortably. So again, bringing gamma motor tone some theory into this as well. Again, that's all addressing this tissue extensibility dysfunction. More classic treatment styles like pin and stretch of the muscle, the soft tissue work. Um, you can do things like instrument assisted soft tissue mobilizations where you're scraping the muscles there. Um, even some cupping in, in a sense will do this similar work. And then again, stretching uh, coupled with active muscle contraction, so more like dynamic stretching just to be more effective to really get things to open up and get those gamma motor neurons adapting to that uh, new length and position. Okay, so to conclude a shorter topic today, we discussed the difference between a tissue extensibility dysfunction and a joint mobility dysfunction, joint mobility being more at the joint capsule itself and some of the passive structures of that joint, while the tissue extensibility um, dysfunction is at the more of the active tissue around a joint like the muscles and the different uh, ways that they are uh, gauged and innervated and adapted. That's how we go about deciding how to address each one is the whether or not it is that capsule where we're getting into that capsule distracting that joint or if we're working more on the soft tissue itself the um, the muscle and we're getting those gamma motor neurons involved and stretching and lengthening the muscle and uh, readapting it to a lengthened position so important stuff that um, we have both of those taken care of we understand how to assess for both and then how to treat both you had some takeaways some things you can try at home regarding a few different joints of the body when it comes to a joint mo mobilization dysfunction. But also, we need to keep in mind that this is just one aspect of the athlete or the uh, fitness enthusiast, right, where they are working on, we're working on mobility. Again, we need to also make sure that we're working on motor control, where there's deficits in motor control, strength, power, um, stability, right? So this is just one component of many. We need to know how to assess for all those different components and then how to be really good at treating them in a kind of spectrum as we go from rehab to performance world. Um, so yeah, if you have any questions on any of that stuff, there's other articles. Check out the blog on the website under the blog tab. It's integratedrpc.com. I go to the blog tab. Uh, if you want to reach out, go to the um, email contact at integratedrpc.com or just go to the website and you can fill out just a quick little um, information on there to send me a message and we can we can figure out getting on the schedule or just go right to scheduling a discovery visit or call um, again right on the website where you can schedule that free first discovery visit or call where we can talk about what's going on and if it's the right fit for you and, and kind of how we can help you otherwise check out the other podcast on spotify and youtube and sign up for the newsletter under the um, blog tab as well to have the kind of word and written version of these blogs sent directly to your email every Monday. And um, they are all archived on the website as well. So lots going out to you guys. Uh, thanks for listening. We'll see you in the next one. Bye.